you had to come with a little bit more than just the best players. All them people that they say are the best to ever do it, yeah. my teams beat all of them. <laughs> Welcome to Full Body. I'm Channing Fry. As the wines get darker, the questions are going to get deeper. Let's go. Isaiah Thomas, Zeke, coach, boss, mentor. First of all, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be here with us on Full Bodied. It's amazing to me to be able to open up another African-American man's champagne. Oh, most definitely. This is one of my favorite things about being in the champagne in the, in the wine space is that you get to, you know, pop and drink <laughs> and sip and you get to have great conversation. Where did this idea or opportunity come from? You're an inner city kid from Chicago. <laughs> You're, are you the only black man that owns champagne grapes in Champagne? I'm, I'm the only black man and I'm the only American that owns the grapes uh, in Champagne. As you know, they won't let an American own land there. So uh, right. we own all the rights to the grapes that come off the land that allows us to give you the first press of the grape. And what I discovered is that here in America, a lot of the champagnes that we get are second and third press, loaded with sugar, very high in sulfites. So consequently, you get a headache when you drink it. This is all Le Champion, and it is 100% Pinot. You probably won't find another 100% Pinot in the United States. And if you do, it's maybe one or two of them. This is delicious. You've had every single job. You've been a coach, you've been a GM. You've been an owner, you've been a player. When you were playing, did you know when I get done, these are the things that I want to accomplish? Even when I was playing, I was what you might call a, a serial entrepreneur. I experimented a lot, you know, in business, uh, and, and a lot of it came around the city of Detroit and in Michigan. I started a candy bar called Isaiah Bars after the Reggie Jackson bars, after the Reggie bar. <laughs> put that on the shelf, and then I partnered with Stroh's Ice Cream, put Stroh's Ice Cream into the supermarkets, into the shelf. And then the next product, uh, as you talked about, was popcorn, because I love popcorn. Yep. And, oh, I know it. Uh, so when Did you enter that Times Square? That popcorn was hidden. Yeah. I'm a popcorn guy, man. Yeah, you remember that. I see where you got in champagne. You're celebrating all these wins. You ain't got no losses. <laughs> <laughs> well, this champagne is called Le Champion. Oh, you got to look at this color, Channing. I'm, I'm oh. always fascinated by how, you know, the, the color of the champagne is and and how tight the bubbles are. And, and Channing, you will notice, as this champagne kind of settles a little bit, it gets a lot smoother. And that's what I love about this champagne. Some champagnes you drink and you have a whole fight in your mouth. Uh, where you, <laughs> before, you know, you have to swish it around For sure. and stuff before you can even swallow it. So the e -rap. When I first saw this, you know, I'm, I'm old and my, my eyes ain't so good, right? Uh, but I play it off because <laughs> I don't want to put the glasses on. <laughs> So right. when I oh, first yeah. looked at it, I was like, oh, this earth champagne. I mean, earth wine. <laughs> <laughs> I called it earth. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, earth, wind, and fire's yeah, wine. Yeah, exactly, right? exactly. It only comes out in September. Ah, oh, there you go. That's nice. I like that. This is a white Pinot Noir. Erath has been around and is one of the better producers in the Willamette Valley. Whether that's smoke or whether that's something going on with the skins of the grape, mm. they have to take the skins off and press, yeah, right? Yeah, and so yeah, you're yeah. getting the essence of the Pinot Noir without the color. Yeah. Let's go back just a little bit farther. You told me a story. You growing up, having your coach, in your house, you're on your recruiting visit with your mom and your brother there. Yeah. Tell everybody that story. And then I'll bring it back around to this wine. So I'm assuming that you're talking about uh, Coach Knight when I was um, being recruited to go to Indiana University. And, and as you know, we were, we were poorer than poor. When Coach Knight came to visit, we had uh, no electricity. And, and so when he came over, so all my brothers was there, you know, my mom was there. And we had been offered a lot of things to go to different colleges, you know, money and, right. you know, cars and homes. And, 
And again, we had nothing. Ooh, blue chips? Yeah, blue we, chips? I mean, I mean, Chen, I actually turned down blue chips. <laughs> it came back to you. It yeah, came back. so we got offered all kinds of things, right? And this one college coach came to our house, opened up a briefcase, and said, hey, there's $50,000 in here. If your son comes to this college, you get $50,000. Now, Channing, we had never seen $50,000 before in our life. As far as we know, Ooh. it could have only been $1,000 in that briefcase. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so now Coach Knight comes, and I remember him sitting there saying, you know, Mrs. Thomas, you know, I'm only going to offer your son three things. A, he's going to get a good education. B, I'm going to teach him everything I know about the game of basketball. And C, he'll be a gentleman. You know, I remember my brothers looking at me and me looking at them. Like, well, okay, well, we're not going to Indiana. <laughs> I mean, this is this, <laughs> this ain't gonna work, you know? And so Channing, so now the the lights are going down, so it's getting darker in the house. And as it's getting a little darker, you know, we have roaches, right? So there's a yep. there's, there's yep. a roach that's crawling right behind Coach Knight. And I'm like, oh, please go back. Please go back in. <laughs> and the roach is crawling down the wall. And I'm saying to myself, oh, man, I hope don't nobody see that roach coming down the wall. <laughs> so now, you know, the conversation gets, you know, they get to talking about where are you going to play and, you know, how, how's it going to be at Indiana. My mom asked Coach Knight, you know, a pretty serious question. She said, you know, the, the clan is in Martinsville, Indiana. If my son gets into, you know, any type of issues, who's going to protect him? You know, he said, well, you know, if we're winning, Mrs. Thomas, the Klan will protect him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. He said that to your mother? Yeah, but, you know, in a joking <laughs> kind of way, right? My brother's like you. Like, he didn't, he didn't think that was a joke. So he no. was like, yo, what yeah, yeah. the F you mean, so forth and so on. Coach Knight was like, well, you know, it's just a joke and nothing. And so now I look over at my brother and he's lit. Now he ready to fight. And Coach Knight said something back to him. And then he said, well, you know, if you want to do something now, we can take this outside. And I'll never forget, <laughs> Coach Knight got up, took his jacket off, rolled up his sleeves, <laughs> and said, yeah, we can go outside. <laughs> And, and so now the whole house is in an uproar, right? My mother is sitting there, and, you know, I'm looking at her for, for her reaction, right? And for I'm guidance. Thinking, like, what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah, and, and she's sitting there like this. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, no. She, she like him, right? And so it, <laughs> it, it didn't get into nothing. You know, they broke it up and everything. And my mom had a press conference. I was sitting next to her, and she said, my son has made his decision. He's decided that he's going to Indiana <laughs> University to play for Coach Bob Knight. And I was sitting there like this. <laughs> but you, yeah, know, it and, uh, you had no the best choice. She made. Yeah. Here's what I'll say about that. I, uh, both of us have been coached by amazing coaches mm. throughout our NBA career, throughout our college career. And one thing they didn't do was look at us based on our skin. They looked at us as men. They looked at us as how can they, how can I make them yes. better? Like how can I, how can they make the other pieces that I have better, right? And I feel like when you have an opportunity to have a vineyard, right? And things don't go the, the exact way, you're looking at how can I still tell this story? Right. Um, and so for me, this white Pinot Noir forever will be whether it is this 2015 or whether it's 2020 or whatever year, White Pinot to me is making the best out of sometimes tough situations. I think you're different, right, from a lot of GMs or a lot of owners and a lot of coaches because they want to shy away from the personal relationships with players, right? That is not business. That relationship and that trust is some people just, they put players on a carousel. Yeah. Right? Without getting to know them and, and they want to talk. You can't talk to each player the same way. To tell you something even crazier is I still live in Portland. You sent me where I've lived for 14 years. Yeah. We're going to open up this last Pino. When you were playing, who were guys that you felt like you had to have the utmost preparedness for and respect. Obviously, it was Jordan. Obviously, it was Bird. Obviously, it was Magic. But who are some of the guys, some of the unknowns that you were like, this dude can go, but just 
doesn't get enough credit for it. The first name that comes to mind right now is Maurice Cheeks, who just went into yep. the Hall of Fame. Now, Mo Cheeks is from Chicago also. And I remember when I when I first came into the league, you know, Philadelphia was rolling. Channing, they was rolling. I mean, he, Andrew, Tony, you know, Bobby Jones, Dr. J, Moses Malone. It was like Lionel Holland. You was like, damn, like, where do we get a break? You know, most guards would slide their feet, but Mo Cheeks hopped. Yeah. You know? And and so that gave him <laughs> that gave him an extra quick quickness and an extra bounce. And so I would go through my stuff, na 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 real hard between my legs, <laughs> give my best shake, and he'll say, huh. <laughs> and I was like, oh and man. Just be still be there. Yeah, still be there. Oh. And and I, I couldn't shake him. Yeah, but he like... was the guy that, that gave me the most problems defensively. These are stories that I think we need to continue to tell about different players. You know, in today's media, we we always talk about the top 20 or the top 50, but each generation, there are so many players that get overlooked that had a huge influence. Like, there's no James Harden if Manu Ginobili doesn't come with that Euro step first. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and that should be the story. Like, James Harden is amazing, but Manu Ginobili, like, and, and here's the truth. We swept the Spurs in 2010. You know who was the only dude that we had to double team? Was Manu Ginobili when they ran wow. that, that sideline screen, when they ran that 1 4 1 5. If you had to have like a starting five of these dudes are just hoopers who don't get enough credit from your generation, who would they be, starting with guards? The coaching of today is so drastically different than it was back then. I'm sure Magic Johnson would have probably had two or three coaches fired because the coaches would have been looking at him like, oh, well, you're a 6'9 center, and you don't shoot the three, so we can't play you at the point guard position. <laughs> no. You know? It, it I mean, you're it, not wrong. I, I, and so in this I, era I think... of basketball, it would, have been, it would have been interesting to see, you know, who would have been successful from all era in this era and what positions would have had to change and who would have yeah. the nerve as a coach to change their coaching style to make those guys successful. I think a lot of coaches coach what makes them successful, not coaching to win and what's best for their players, even though it's uncomfortable for them. Yeah. Right? And I think some coaches go, this is what I know, this is what we're gonna do. Culturally, you could do that as a coach, but when it comes to the skills and the talents of your players, your offense and defense has to be 100% representative of who's out there playing. Yeah. You're coaching, you're not playing. How many players really have in their vocabulary what you just articulated is, I'm playing to make winning plays to win the game. <laughs> yeah. I'm not trying to cover my, cover my ass with stats. Right. I was the beginning of the social media era. Right. What happened was, Zeke, and you, you're a test to this. When you would lose in a newspaper, they would say, so-and-so lost, and then that was it. There wasn't no highlight tape where you could cut it, where you're dunking. Nope. You could be down 50, and people are like, man, he's so good. No, you're not good. You're not winning. Yes. Right? Yeah. And so for me, you, you players lost. are falling in <laughs> love with the fate. You lost. Yeah. You're a loser. Right? Yeah. That hurt, right? If you weren't at the championship game, you weren't playing at the Phoenix Suns Arena, America West Arena, you didn't have all the girls on you. Yeah. They'd be like, ugh, yeah, what, yeah, what are yeah, you, yeah, like, yeah, fourth? Yeah, yeah. Gross. Yeah. Right? You know, yeah. it hurt. Hey, my dad used to drop me off at six in the morning at this place called Kiwanis Park in Chandler, Arizona. Because six in the morning, he would have me play against grown men. Yes. Right? So now I'm 12, 13, 14. I'm playing 30 year old men. Yeah. I'm six foot two. They think I'm a little bigger than what I am. That's where you learn shot selection yeah. at. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where you learn listen, you don't want to be somewhere from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. and be sitting on the side every single time. Yeah. To switch back to this wine, right? So this Pinot Noir is Granville, it's the farmhouse cuvee. Jackson is the man. Yeah, this is this is Jackson nice. is a second generation. His dad uh, was a grower. He knows the Willamette Valley like the back of his hand. He's making it more new age. This is a wine that is like the middle of the week wine. Where you're like, I just want a pure Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. I want what Willamette Valley tastes like. And this is it. It's a smooth, you know, 
goes down easy. There is no new oak on this, and that to me is what makes really good wine. It's restraint, and, and for me, it's drinkable, it's approachable. It's like not, you don't feel a certain way about it, except this is delicious. I remember one of my first um, uh, tastings, right? And they, and they said, you know, spit it out, right? And I, I was like, okay, I, and I did that. <laughs> As the day went on, you know, you just started smelling it, right? And oh, yeah. what I didn't know is that you can get a high from smelling it. Like, oh, oh man, is that what got you in the other industry? If you just walk around <laughs> and you're just smelling it, you're like, actually, you know what got me in the other industry? In the cannabis and the hemp space, it's actually my son. My son oh. and my daughter, you know, they're younger. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, you indul would assume. they indulge, <laughs> right? <laughs> but then my son and my daughter start saying, hey, you know, you, you need to start studying this a little bit more because it helps with my anxiety, it helps with my depression. Right. My, my daughter has narcolepsy and, you know, I, I wore shoes yeah, today. Yeah, so show us those shoes. The Sleep Project, everybody should check it out. But my daughter was diagnosed with, with narcolepsy. The doctors were saying, hey, why don't you, you try a little, you know, marijuana for your depression or your anxiety right, or right. whatever. That's when I really started looking into the plant. But I've gotten into the business. I'm vice chairman, CEO of this company called One World Farmer. If you had to get five players from today's game and play a seven-game series against the, your bad boy Pistons, who would those players be? The, the question is, what rules are we playing by? We're playing by the 80s rules, your rules. I'm going to pick a team that, talent-wise, would give us a, a, a hard time. You would break them. Yeah, where our mentality was and what our, <laughs> and what our defensive scheming was, right? It all depends yeah. on what coach you put in with these five players. Because you, right. you just weren't going to beat us with talent. We proved that against the Lakers, Chicago, and Boston. You right, had to right, come right. with a little bit more than just the best players. Because we're going to make you think for two and a half hours and for 48 minutes. And if there's a weak link on your team, oh, we're going to exploit that. That type of mentality is the most ferocious mentally grinding mentality yeah. and like I you've you've proven that that works only for y'all like yeah. you can't copy that style if we are talking the top 25 best players ever yeah you beat all three of, of the top 10 in their teams oh, all, all of them, of them. Right? <laughs> all them people that they say are the, are the, are the best to ever do it yeah, yeah. my teams beat all of them you know we probably was the best defensive team to ever play in the NBA now, they've showed you some highlights of us. Uh, they showed a few clips of us <laughs> fouling people hard, and then they, you know, wrote a, a few paragraphs around it, and they said, okay, this is the Pistons. But when you go back and you watch the Pistons play and you talk to all the coaches that you've played for, all of them are trying yep. to emulate the way we play defense. They tell you from one perspective, but they don't show you the whole game. Still, the highest scoring game ever in the NBA is held by who? The Detroit Pistons at 186 Ooh. points. That's what we scored who were against you the playing? Denver Nuggets. Grandmas and grandpas? We was playing against the Denver Nuggets, 186, 184. <laughs> it's the altitude. It's the, the highest altitude. scoring game ever, right? <laughs> How many games have you actually seen of the Detroit Pistons in your lifetime? Think about that. I mean, to be honest, off top, I've only seen clips of Dennis Rodman doing his thing. Yeah, they I've seen you clips a few of clips. you when you hurt your ankle. Right, but I've never, they don't really show you guys as a whole, even though you're champions. Those yeah. who haven't become champions can't understand that sacrifice, don't understand that journey, and therefore, they lower the bar and say that uh, you were just lucky to be on the championship team. I think we have the greatest championship in the history of basketball. 100%. We, we're the only, yes, 100%. that's how I feel. Down 3-1 in the NBA Finals to historically, they were saying one of the greatest teams Two. to ever play and come back and win the series. That is the greatest feat in NBA championship play that I've ever witnessed in my life. The basketball game is 40 minutes, but being a basketball player is 24-7. 24-7. I talk to my wife 
four minutes. I yes. say, hey, baby, hey, hey, I love you. Okay, I gotta go back to my team. Yeah. We are stretching together. We are eating together. We are recovering together. Even if somebody was just getting a massage, you'd have three, four people yeah. in the room watching film, yep. talking, sitting. Yep. We yep. were so close. Yes. Right? And even to this day, we're on the same text chain. We still communicate. Same and, here. And I'm curious to you, are you still in communication? Obviously, with Lane Beer, you are. But how many of your teammates do you talk to still after all these years? We have a group text where we text every night. And, and in the text, we'll say, I love you. We'll say, you know, F you. Yeah, right. Wish each other happy birthdays. What you just talked about, again, in terms of that, that sacrifice, that discipline, how many players are willing to make that? Braun plays for lineage. Braun plays for Mount Rushmore of NBA. This man plays every game to try to be the greatest player of all time. So when you look at his schedule and how he eats, how he approaches a game, what he knows, what he doesn't know, how he talks, is on a level that when you humble yourself and say, okay, you are different. Yeah. Then you can accept who he is and why he acts the way he does. I'm gonna give you two stories and to, to punctuate what you just said about LeBron. But I said to him, I said, you know, you have to accept the challenge of trying to be the greatest player to ever play because not many of us, including myself, has ever had the opportunity to play for being the greatest player to ever play. Fast forward, right? He asked me, okay, what do, what do I, I said, you got, you got to become smarter at the game. I said, the brain is a muscle. So you have to start reading before the game. So when it's time for you to go out and play, your brain is firing. You're the one that told him that. I'm the one that told him that. Who are the players that, that we had to beat? So Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, they thought mm. like LeBron James. They understood that type of detail in the game. Larry right. Bird, Dennis Johnson, they understood that type of detail in the game. So when you talk about playing against those guys, Channing, in my era, we had three teams in terms of Philly, Boston, and LA, that they had two to three guys on a team that thought like LeBron. That's how good those teams oh. were. To beat those teams, you had to have your own unique hot sauce. Yeah. Right? You, couldn't, you couldn't use somebody else's sauce on their chicken. The hot sauce had you to had come to from bring the your brain. own type of sauce, exactly. Hey man, like I said, you can run fast, you can jump high, you can dunk, you can do all that stuff. But if you can't think, oh, we can ready to yeah. kill you. What do you want people to think about your legacy? I would say as a, as a person overcoming all the obstacles and the odds of growing up on the west side below the poverty line, I was the kid that wasn't supposed to make it to 18, wasn't supposed to graduate from college, wasn't supposed to get into UC Berkeley and get a master's in education. I was the kid that strived to get out of the, the, the ghetto, strived to get out of hard times, and then I happened to play basketball. Your personhood, your honesty, your trust, uh, your, your sacrifice, your discipline, like, you know, who are you as a person? And I would want people to remember me as the person I was, not necessarily the basketball player I was. Because if all you can remember me for is that I was a good basketball player, then I've done a bad job with the rest of my life. Thank you, man. I mean, Zeke, obviously, like, I would do this for hours with you. I appreciate your time. You're the best. Thanks for being on Full Bodies. Thank you, and I love you. And I really mean that. I love you too, man. You're the best. Thank you.